Welcome to podcast number 38 on the danjohnuniversity.com site. We have a question from Kyle. I know you're a huge fan of them, and he's referring to loaded carries, and call them game changers. Yeah, the, the reason I use that word game changer so much is like there's a point where you're doing something <clears throat> and, you know, you, you get a little better, you get a little better, and all of a sudden you, you hit a standard or you hit a point where all of a sudden this new thing you've added obviously makes a huge difference. Uh, the discus goes farther in the Highland Games. You improve across every event. Uh, you jump higher, you know, going from the straddle to the the Fosbury flop and the high jump. These are game changers where what you see going in is different than what you see coming out. Uh, my question is this. How much do you think it has contributed to grip strength improvements that can be obtained from weighted carries? Well, obviously, and I think, boy, I think with aging research, it's, it's really clear that grip strength is an indicator. It's probably the best indicator of your age. Uh, not the age that's on your birth certificate or your driver's license, but your actual physical age. So, yeah, grip strength, uh, anything that improves grip strength, I think, is always important. Also, yeah, there's a thing you'll see in some of the biology books called, I think it's called Homoculus Man. Uh, and it has huge eyes and massive uh, fingers and genitalia and, I, and one or two other areas. It's, uh, it represents the amount of uh, nerve uh, nerves that's, that go into those areas, for, which is why your hands are, are so important. Um, the things you can do like type and stuff like that, your eyes, I mean, really, I guess in a way, your eyes and your fingers almost define being human in 2020. That's a terrible thing to say, but if you get the point I'm trying to make. Uh, the only issue I would have with your question, Kyle, is many of the loaded carries that I do and that I emphasize really aren't that grip dominant. True, the farmer walk and the suitcase carry, I mean, those are those are probably the two most important. But I'm a huge fan of the bear hug carry. Uh, if you look at the cover of the book, Never Let Go, I'm bear hug carry. And in fact, well, this hand is like this because it's still in a cast. Um, uh, the waiter walks, um, the, the heavy backpacks dragging sleds. Uh, that whole juggernaut family without the farmer walks. We, you don't need uh, loaded carries. But yeah, I think that's a big part of it. I guess I guess your question uh, could be even expanded along more, Kyle. Uh, maybe that's why the pull-up is so important. Maybe that's why the deadlift is so important. Uh, maybe that's why the farmer walk is so important. Uh, this is actually a, a pretty good insight. Um, that would be, you know, if you focused on a pull-up, deadlift uh, farmer walk uh, program for a while, you know, the, the hit on your grip would be through the roof. Um, would you make improvements? M maybe so. Going on with this idea, is that perhaps why the the squat, the, the whole family of squats, uh, are so important for mass building, for building uh, muscular size? Because they don't involve any grip. And so you, the whole the whole rest of the body has to step up and accommodate and adapt. Um, yes. So yes, that is a major part of why loaded carriers are so good. I also think though, and, and don't ignore this, the fact that you're, 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 you're adding to the gait pattern, G A I T under, under load under stress is something most people have not done in their training for a long time. And, uh, it's, you know, with Milo or Milo, uh, the, you know, the guy who picked up the bowl, the, the light bowl the first day, and then, you know, every day picked it up for a year. Um, he did loaded carries, you know, he didn't do, uh, he didn't do French presses or reverse curls. So yeah, your question's very good. And I got to thank you, Kyle, because that insight about the pull up, the deadlift and the farmer walk, uh, kind of has my mind spinning ahead a little bit. So thank you. Uh, we have another Kyle asking us a question today. I remember reading a comment you made some years ago about the training of the Egyptian Olympic team. Uh, Kyle, I don't think that they were the Egyptian Olymp Olympic lifting team, but because of that, I think the, the, the answer I'm going to give is going to be a little bit better. 
As I remember, you said something along the lines that they used one barbell and kept adding weight, but changed the movements as the weight increased. Could you elucidate on this? I am here to elucidate today. It's a very elucidative day. Um, let's, let's break this down into a, a, a couple of ideas. First, the first time I'd ever heard about this, uh, I believe the coach was from Iowa State, and I could be wrong on that. But his idea was when you're training throwers is that you put the barbell in front of them and you would do an exercise. Uh, I'm going to do my best to replicate it uh, off the top of my head. Let's say at first we're going to do power snatch. So we power snatch until the load's too heavy and we now have to squat snatch. When the load gets too heavy for squat snatch, we start to power clean. When the load gets too heavy for power cleans, we start squat cleaning. When the load gets too heavy for squat cleans, we clean pull. When the load gets too heavy for clean pulls, we deadlift. Thank you very much. The bar never went down. We just moved ahead. I think there's some real wisdom in that. Uh, for one thing, it reminds me of what Marty Gallagher does on his Sunday training sessions. He has 13 people train and they have one bar. And the bar starts off at 45 pounds. And if you need to take that, you take it. Then we add the next weight, we add the next weight. Uh, maybe I don't want to warm up until 135. When 135 shows up, I take it. The next weight I want to take is 225. But we have four or five people, you know, need to take intermediate lifts. They do it. And when we all finish our squats, then we move to our bench press. And when we finish our bench press, then we move to our deadlift. At the end of the day, thank you very much. We all go home. And it's uh, kind of nice and way you don't have to clean up one, one uh, barbell. I'm wondering if you're thinking about the Iranian weightlifters from about uh, a decade ago. And the one great weightlifters program that I thought was, I still think is br brilliant. Uh, basically, he had two training sessions a day of, of eight lifts each. No, not eight different lifts, but eight platform lifts. One, he would Olympic squat snatch. He would do one, add weight, do another, add weight, do another, add weight. He clean and jerk, add weight, clean and jerk, add weight, clean and jerk, add weight, back squat for two, back squat for two. I think the back squats were doubles. The other session, power snatch, adding weight every time, power clean, adding weight every time, front squat. And that was it. Is there, are there advantages to doing this? Um, well, yeah, I mean, the one nice thing I think, and you can already see it, I mean, if we if we believe in progressive resistance, which is the foundation of, of strength training, um, what you're seeing in the program here is the bar is constantly going up. Uh, you finish with the heaviest weight of the day, and then you walk out the door. Um, you don't need a lot of equipment, which is always a good thing when we're training people. So, Kyle, uh, I hope that kind of, answers your question, I think, um, is there, is this something every single person who's listening can do? Uh, probably not. As you can see, you really have to know both the Olympic lifts and the power lifts to do this kind of thing. And, uh, there, there might be better tools for most people, but this is something that to keep in your back pocket. If you ever are in a situation where you only have one bar and I've been in those situations as a coach, and it, it's, if you do it like Marty does, you can see that you can do it with powerlifting or with Olympic lifting, or really for throwers, you can combine the two. I hope that helped. Joshua asks a question. Do you recommend weightlifting shoes for deadlifts and squats? Well, not deadlifts, no. I, in fact, I think it really helps to have the thinnest sole you have. Um, for squats, and that's going to be one of those things. When I Olympic lift, I wear uh, weightlifting boots. And the reason I wear the boots is because I need that heel. And I need that, uh, uh, th they have all these straps and things like that, that pretty much, they're not comfortable. You know, this is something you, I, I don't know if I could run in them. I know I've jumped in them a few times in happiness, but they are, they are made for keeping you grounded. Um, he asks a follow-up question, and this is where this is where things get a little. Hmm. And if you do, what about ancillary training when you're done with the main lifts? Well, that's the issue. Uh, 
when I trained at Dick Notmeyer's, when I got off my motorcycle, I went in the gym. The first thing I would do was put on my weightlifting boots and I would take them off and put them in my gym bag um, when we got done about three hours later. Uh, they were just on my feet. I wore them the entire workout. It's because I snatched and I clean and jerked. I did front squats and that's really all we did. Uh, I did some, the warm-ups were snatches and the warm-ups were clean and jerks and the warm-ups were front squats. If all you're doing is the Olympic lift, then you keep those boots on. Weightlifting shoes, well, and of course nowadays you can buy these hybrid shoes, but I, I think they're silly. I, I don't even know why you'd waste your money. Um, and any pair of normal flat shoes, not those soft jogging shoes, because, you know, <laughs> uh, well, it's only happened once that I've seen, but I've heard other people have it where you lift weights and because of the load, the the shoe blows apart as you're lifting. Now, maybe you caught it wrong and you just went through it, but I don't want the bottom of your shoe coming off uh, while you're with a heavy weight. Odd, isn't it? Um, so, yeah, I if you're an Olympic lifter, I think it's a yes. If you're a power lifter, you would probably have a pair of shoes for squatting and probably something else for your bench press and deadlifting. Um, but unless you're really lifting, you know, big time in the weight room, I, I don't think there's any value to having them. Um, in Throughout my career, I could always snatch and clean and jerk about 80% of my best without even an issue wearing any shoes I had on. It didn't matter. But to go from, and I'll, do, I'll try to do both kilos and pounds here, but you know, I could probably come in at my peak and easily power clean 315, probably squat clean 335 um, without an issue. And then in the meet, I, but I would need boots to go 385 and clean and jerk. Uh, so basically, I mean, I could power clean 140, 145K anytime, probably jump up to 150 range uh, or higher with a squat clean. But the clean and jerk 175 and more, uh, K, uh, K, I, I needed my boots. So the, I would just say this general population, you don't need them. But if you're competing, absolutely you do. Callum asks a question. It's one of those questions that the first time I looked at it, I was like, "It." real quick, uh, Callum, uh, before we start, I want to answer your question, Callum. But it's like when I get emails from people about Mass Made Simple and they say, Dan, can I add long distance running or marathon training or triathlon training to Mass Made Simple? And my first response is always, are you doing the program? The answer is always, no, I just read about it. Uh, and, and of course, I'll respond back, well, of course, I knew that because nobody has ever said to me on week two of Mass Made Simple, jeepers, can I do more? Generally like, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. So let's get to the question. Please, can you, and thank you for saying that. Please, can you expand on tumbling you get your athletes to do? Okay, and then there's two follow-ups and the follow-ups were the problem. Yeah, um, first off, I think it's really important uh, just for life skills to learn how to break fall first. So we start very simply with laying on the mat, uh, and bringing the chin here and practicing the slapping drills that you would see in any martial arts. From there, we practice the basic shoulder rolls because I think those are very important. I also teach them how to break a fall falling straight onto their, their into a plank and how to break a fall kind of rolling backwards. After we go through the shoulder rolls, which are really quite easy, if you think about, uh, I teach it as wagon wheels, you're just kind of rolling with the ground or a, not, a nice image is the ground is rolling underneath you. It's, it's actually a good one. Then we move to the uh, traditional somersault, the forward roll family. We then go to the backward roll, and there's a couple of different ones there. I've actually found that teaching the roll into a handstand and then coming out of that backwards easier. Um, many people struggle on the backward roll because you, you, you have to get these arms synchronized as they go backwards. After we go through the basic rolls, that's when I would, that's when I add 
things like bear crawls and G.I. Joe crawls, uh, whatever you want to call them. Leopard crawls is one name now. I don't know the difference between a leopard crawl and a Spider-Man crawl. I, I don't. But we teach all, all those things. Um, we also do bear crawls, all these crawls, forward and backwards. And after we've done that for a while, we then move into the cartwheel family. Uh, it's interesting because most of my female athletes are magnificent at cartwheels, but only in one direction, which is kind of funny to watch. So the boys generally aren't good in either direction, but they're at the same level of not good. Whereas the young ladies tend to be world-class, I mean, Olympic gymnasts in one direction, and then they look like two-year-old girls in the other, which is kind of funny. And so the boys quickly build up both directions. And I've had to learn to insist that the female athletes do cartwheels in both directions. From there, we move to round-offs, which is... Uh, the way I teach it is I tell them it's uh, cartwheels for distance. So you do a cartwheel and you try to, you know, throw your legs as far as you can. You try to, you know, throw yourself as far as you can. And that's really a, uh, quite an easy way to do. From there, we then would start combining shoulder rolls with cartwheels, you know, shoulder roll left, shoulder roll right, cartwheel left, cartwheel right, and, and move into combinations. Um, the handstand family will be taught at this time. Uh, I teach the very simple, uh, the yoga one, uh, the brace one, uh, the, uh, and then of course the, 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 well, I teach it now with a cartwheel that you don't all the way finish. Uh, you just, you, you go into a handstand from a cartwheel. We also teach going into a handstand from a backward roll and uh, just kind of a walk into it. Um, the nice thing, if you do have padded walls, uh, insert joke about me spending a lot of time in rooms with padded walls. Um, it's nice because you can you can practice handstands against the wall. And one of my favorite drills is marching in place. So my feet are up on the wall and I'm, I'm just doing that. Oh, you can really go much deeper than that. Um, but honestly, if you master the basic rolls, you back, if you get cartwheels done, if you play around with some handstands and toadstools and some of those, you know, smaller, easy preliminary uh, handstands, you, you pretty much have the bulk of it. Now, the follow-up question, including the rationale behind it. Why? Well, I've said this many times, but the most dangerous thing in this home for me at my age is the floor. And, um, you know, statistically, it's better for me to get cancer at my age than to slip and break a joint on the floor here uh, for my longevity. So the first thing I want to teach people is how to break a fall. And I think step one in breaking a fall, practicing stumble proofing, that would be some, some basic things like speed skater drills and stuff like that. But from there, learning how to break a fall, how to take a fall, how to roll with a fall, uh, is good for long-term, just long-term health and longevity. Having said that, uh, I took judo as a child, and I, I, I not long ago watched my last high school football game, and it's apparent how good I am on the ground. Uh, this guy cuts my legs, I roll, and I'm back into the play. Well, on paper, he made his block, so he hit the, his X, well, I guess his O blocked my X. However, I rolled and made the tackle. Um, if you get knocked down, you jump back up. You know, the old cliche, get knocked down seven times, jump back up eight. Um, so those are the two big. When did I first introduce it? Well, we were doing tumbling as part of our basic physical education in my youth. Uh, it's interesting how much better fit PE was when I was young. It was so much better. But we tumbled uh, in... Uh, at Southwood Junior High, um, it was part of our basic Southwood uh, weightlifting program, um, the Southwood program, which I talk about all the time, power clean, military press, front squat, bench press. By the way, that program is still better than 99% of the crap I see online. Um, as a coach, I did not use it at Utah State when I was coaching up there, I, I, and I I don't know the value of tumbling for track and field athletes, but as soon as I could uh, start uh, doing things full-time, I would say 
it was before I met Tiffany, so it'd be in the 80s. I had I had that summer weightlifting program and tumbling and certain fighting drills were part of our general training. Um, we did hill sprints, uh, tumbling, uh, general fighting, and then basic weightlifting. So I've been doing it a while. Um, there's, if you can find a, a good tumbling resource, uh, get it. Uh, very often, some of the best tumbling resources I knew in the high school campus were cheerleaders. Uh, they actually were very good, very helpful for me because many of them came from a gymnastics background. And by the way, whenever you ask, people are very helpful. And, that's a, 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 and that was a great resource for me in, in the high school settings. In the collegiate settings, uh, you would think that uh, you would have someone who knows tumbling, but I don't know if that's even true anymore on the college campus. Uh, you, but again, ask. Someone will be there to help you. Thank you. Well, we have a question from Noah. Noah, I wanted to ask if you had any opinions on how old-time strongmen like Sandow, Saxon, Hackenschmidt trained. Um, I only know what I've read. Now, I've read, uh, I know I've read Hackenschmidt's book for sure, and I know Saxon's work because of some of the lifts he did, and I know Sandow because, I mean, he's just such an important figure of the period. Uh, how did they train? The most interesting thing, and just remember this, they didn't have adjustable weights. They had fixed weights. So back then, you would get a bar, let's just say 100 pounds, and it doesn't matter if it's kilos or pounds, but let's, for the example, and uh, you, would, uh, you would lift it, and you would do as many exercises as you could with that load. And in an exercise like the press, when you first got it, you could press it one time. Over time, you'd press it two, three, four, five, and you got stronger. Pretty soon, you'd press it five to eight times, and you'd begin to hit into hypertrophy uh, and, and some power, I guess. And then you'd go to eight to 12, and you start to slide over into muscular endurance, and pretty soon, you're up to 25, and the load was too light. So then you think to yourself, hmm, that bar is too light, so let's try it one-handed. And then you'd try one-handed, or you'd lay on the ground, and you'd do a... a, a you'd, you know, go arm's length and do a Turkish get up or you would roll it on your back and do some kind of thing. Um, most of them, so with fixed weights, you, you played around with this, this, this implement, this, this toy until you got, you know, kind of good at doing it. It's, it's kind of a real lost concept in strength training. Um, you know, Delorme uh, and Watkins developed this concept of what we now call sets and reps. It, it's really relatively new, just barely older than I am. Uh, the other thing they, they did is they also spent a lot of time with just about anything they could pick up. And they would just invent movements. When you read the books, they're doing just anything they can think of because they don't have... Well, they don't have adjustable weights first. And then the other thing is there, there's there's no real uh, school. There's no tradition yet because they're literally inventing the tr tradition of what it means to lift weights. When you look back on films from the 1930s of Olympic lifting, you look at the techniques. Uh, 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 John Davis, the, the great multi-world champion, you look at his techniques and they're just, well, I don't want to get too deep but they're not very good i mean and but over time we get better and better and better what important things can we take from them that aren't in current strength training vogue well the idea and i think this is like i said this years ago you know if all i had was a 16 kilogram kettlebell and you said dan get better if that's all i had uh my brain and my training would have to leap up and figure out ways to get better. That's the thing I think is best. Uh, we have a gym over here, not, not, not Epic where I train, but another one right next to it. And you go in there and they have 5,000 different machines. Um, they, I, they've got to have, and I mean this, 13 or 14 different curl machines. And I see all these guys who look like they've never lift weights in their life in there for hours. Uh, and they're doing all kinds of different varietals of this machine, and you never see them improve. Um, this is a basic uh, teaching point I have. 
deprivation leads to increased capacity. If you don't have everything, you figure out ways to do things better. So Noah, really, the greatest thing you can learn from them is, as I'm saying this, we're in the middle of the coronavirus, and I'm just wondering if on the other side of this, uh, people are going to come away better, uh, faster, uh, more defined, bigger, uh, you know, because everyone has to now use their brain to, to, to deal with the lack of equipment. So, yeah, I think, no, I think there are some great lessons to learn from those guys. Uh, did they do everything right? No, not even close. But they were inventing things as they went along. And sometimes that's more right than right. All right, my friend, thanks so much. Well, thank you once again, folks. Uh, this was Podcast 38. And remember, if you have questions, email them to podcast at danjohnuniversity.com and we'll do our best to answer each and every question. Hey, thanks so much.